Professor Nelson with Conestoga College School of Workforce Development. This week I'd like to look at traditional quality tools and their application under Industry 4.0. As we've been looking at in previous videos, Industry 4.0 includes many new technologies that are changing industry, the way it works and the products that it produces, even to the entire life cycle of the product. But within this course, we're focused on the quality systems and process quality. So what we want to look at today is whether the traditional quality tools that we'll have used in traditional manufacturing still apply within Industry 4.0. Part of the course outcomes we're after here today is a review of traditional quality tools, looking at traditional quality tools in current practice, and then asking the question, are these traditional quality tools obsolete or have they evolved? So I suggest one way of answering this question would be to look at the technology itself, the new technology that's part of Industry 4.0. Look at it from a quality lens and decide what has changed about the technology that has to change the quality that's used or the quality tools that are used. And for this video I'd like to take a fairly straightforward comparison between traditional machining things like CNC milling or turning or grinding compared to 3D printing or more formally additive manufacturing. So let's start with traditional machining. These processes involve some kind of metal removal from some starting material typically in a block form or a bar form and the raw material properties aren't changed by the process so that is the end piece still has the same chemical composition, grain structure, porosity, etc. of the raw material that you started with. So we count on metallurgical inspections at the beginning of the process on the raw material and then a fair reliance that the metallurgical properties haven't changed as a result of the machining. Before I go further in my bullet point list, I'd like you to watch this short video. This is produced by Proto Manufacturing, which is an outsourcing kind of a job shop that companies, but even individuals, can send their CAD models to. And they will do the machining, the milling, the grinding. Um, and what's nice about them for my purposes is they also do injection molding, casting, 3D printing, and so on. So we can compare the quality systems they have in place between traditional machining and same company 3D printing. Let's have a look at their quality systems in CNC machining. three d printers, CNC machines, and injection molding presses are driven by the CAD model's digital instructions for production on a specific machine. But although our quality systems for molding, machining, and three d printing share many similarities, each service has a set of quality measures unique to itself. In our machining business, we use a lot of barcodes. We barcode our raw material blocks. Uh, we barcode every machine that we have um, and when we start a job we print a traveler that also has a barcode on it. Our operators will scan the barcode on the traveler, will scan a barcode on a block, will scan the machine and that ensures that we've got the right traceability to the correct parts and the correct machines and it also ensures that the correct components are used. If for example we select an incorrect block of material that barcoding system will throw up an alert, a warning sign, and it won't let us to continue manufacturing because we've selected the wrong block. So it's a fail-safe system as well. Okay, so I'd like to stop here and point out already the focus here on this idea of traceability. So they've uh, affected a number of measurements on the raw material or had certifications provided with the raw material. And because this, the conditions of the raw material remain constant, relatively speaking, throughout the process, they can count on the end product inheriting the material properties of the raw material. And so this notion of traceability becomes very critical. In the industry that I am uh, very familiar with, aerospace, this is an absolutely critical element to any finished component 
that's used in an aerospace application, the traceability. So one of the things that isn't explicitly said in this video, but I'll point out, is this stress on traceability to the raw material conditions alleviates the need to do extensive destructive testing on finished parts. So rather than cutting up and taking metallurgical assessments of expensive finished components, you spend that money on the cheaper raw material where doing cut-ups is relatively inexpensive because you're only throwing away small pieces of raw material rather than finished parts with all the machining effort put into them. All right, let's continue. Wrong block, so it's a fail-safe system as well. One of the ways that Protolabs is unique is that we've got a lot of software that automates the tool paths for cutting parts in CNC machining or for cutting molds and injection molding so that we don't need to have machinists operating every CNC machine. Instead, we have operators that can operate the CNC machines. When they scan a barcode for a job, they will then be able to download a program for the tool pathing that will operate that machine instead of the operator trying to program it themselves. It's all automated, downloaded, the operator presses go, and the machine can start cutting. When we I'm gonna jump back in and again point out or draw um, connections between traditional machining and this 3D printing idea. He's just said that in CNC machining, there's more of a reliance on the program running the machine than the person running the machine. So he went through it kind of quickly, but he's pointing out that they no longer need experienced machinists running each machine. Instead, they have operators. So what's implied there is uh, lower cost, lower skilled operators who are to be unkind, babysitting the machine. I know that's not always the case. Uh, in my own experience, we needed machinists at every machine. The, com the machining uh, complexity was such that you couldn't rely on the machine itself. It couldn't just run automated and unattended. But in this case, for the kinds of parts that this company is producing, unattended, unattended operation is possible. In a CNC machine to be milled, the machines that we have have probes, and the probes sense the position of the block before we start cutting. Uh, there are probing routines at the beginning of block cutting to ensure that the machine knows the position of the block in order to get the most accurate cut. In CNC machining, we do 100% inspection of every part that is produced. We inspect both for cosmetics and for dimensions. Okay. So he's made two more points there. For them, or for traditional CNC machining, you already have a block or a starting piece in the machine. And so the first set of tests done by the machine is to come in and probe the surface of the part and to know exactly where it is so the cutters don't come in and cut too much air or don't come in and crash into the part, it's important to know where the material is. So those are your first inspection points, is to establish the position of the material. Then he said they do a 100% inspection on the finished products in terms of physically measurable characteristics. Uh, so they'd be spotting it for dimensional accuracy, form control, uh, surface finish, and that sort of thing. It is possible, uh, although it isn't demonstrated here, to stop a machine, uh, turning machine, milling machine, grinding machine. You can stop those anytime during the process, retract the tooling, and uh, measure the machine, or measure the part, either in, still in the machine, or you can remove the part from the machine, measure it, put it back, again, probe it to make sure that you know where it is, and then continue machining, carry on with the program. So that's fairly unique to turning, milling, and grinding. Uh, I want to make a final point here. It's not critical to know, but it is possible to change the material properties during any type of machining operation. There's some work hardening, uh, potentially some overheating uh, um, in local areas, so that can affect hardness or grain structure or grain uh, growth within that localized zone and so there still is a requirement for some destructive testing but it's not significant. You 
you don't have an expectation that the material properties have changed substantially through the machining process. Now let's look at 3D printing. In this case, material is added during the process instead of removed during the process. So instead of having the full piece of raw material there to start with, you have no raw material effectively uh, to start with except on a spool or in sheet form. And the form of the raw material is, is changed completely in the process. So let's have a look at the video. The quality systems that we utilize here at 3D Printing are very similar to the machining and injection molding systems that are used and that we're trying to deliver from a high quality part perspective. As far as quality, when it comes to during the process, we utilize SPC parts to constantly verify processes, making sure they're in control, that they're, that they're not drifting in any certain direction, as well as utilizing mechanical tests to verify stability of the process and that we are still meeting the process as it was designed in the beginning. We utilize our, our tensile tester in, at the initial stage, developing the parameters for the process, developing those machines, validating those machines. We also use, uh, utilize it as the process goes along. We develop tensile test parts on different builds. We then test those to verify that the process is stable and that it's not drifting in one way or another. Using our hard Okay, so that's interesting. If you've noticed, the gentleman who's representing quality for 3D printing, although he said that the processes were very, very similar, has already suggested two quality tools, has already mentioned two quality tools that the gentleman representing traditional machining at the same company didn't mention. First is SPC. SPC, Statistical Process Control, involves taking sample parts from lot to lot or run to run or throughout the day, taking measurements on them and ensuring that the process is staying in control, that it's not drifting, you don't have outliers, uh, you don't have some trend that is working against you in terms of quality. Now that's not to say that SBC isn't used in the traditional sense, but it's useful for us when we're looking, about looking at traditional quality tools and deciding if they're still relevant that here this person is out of the gate already employing a very traditional long-standing quality tool that is SBC to monitor the quality of a brand new technology that is additive manufacturing. All right now here's where he deviates from the other quality team. Immediately starting to talk about doing tensile testing and strength testing Notice that there was no discussion about stress testing in their traditional machining process. And the samples that they are testing here were actually produced on the printer. You would, at least I'm not familiar with, a case where you produce the samples, the tensile test samples, on the milling machine as a measure of the quality of the milling machine process. You would make those through uh, whatever relevant process you have on the raw bar stock. Very frequently you would even outsource it so the test specimens wouldn't even be made in some cases even in the same building let alone on the same piece of equipment. So it's a measure of the raw material from a traditional quality point of view where here it's a measure of that particular printer's quality as you print test specimens that you're going to destruct in a tensile test mode. Next he's going to talk about hardness testing. Again, assuming that the hardness, so this assumes that the hardness is developed as part of the process. It's not dependent on the raw material, it's dependent on the process. So it's traditional, certainly a traditional quality test, but was less necessary in the traditional machining and now a critical piece of additive manufacturing. Using a hardness tester to help ensure that the powder that we're using to create the parts is meeting the guidelines that we've established for our process. We are also using the hardness tester to help 
ensure that the processes performed after the build, such as the heat treats, are being performed to the manner in which they should be. Ensuring repeatability is, is critical to the 3D printing process. We utilize SPC data, spot checks, and other process verification data to ensure that the process is repeatable. And if the process is repeatable, the parts we're manufacturing are repeatable. Forgive me for interrupting the video one more time. Uh, I wanna show you things as they come up rather than waiting to the end. And hopefully that makes more sense here. The spot checking and sample checking, he's stressed, is critical in additive manufacturing. And you can see in this case why that might be. Notice that they're producing several parts at once. In a 3D print bed, there isn't a limitation of printing just, or of manufacturing or milling just one piece. You are printing several identical pieces all at once. Essentially, as many as will fit within the print space. Where on a mach milling machine, you're going to machine one piece, test it, machine one piece, test it, machine one piece, test it. So here there's a need and an opportunity to do sample inspection because there's no guarantee that just because this back corner has been printed properly that the bed wasn't level and the adhesion of the uh, freight front right hand corner or the temperature of the front right corner wasn't significantly different and so these the, these pieces of the corner could fail where all the pieces in the opposite corner could be just perfect. Speaking from experience. We also utilize um, any other dimensional requirements requested by the customers ensuring we meet those and ensuring that in general the overall quality of the part meets what we're trying to do here at Protolabs. The in 3D printing, in my experience and of the technologies that I've reviewed, it would be very, very difficult to do in-process inspection. It's very challenging to stop a process mid-print, take some measurements or do any sort of substantial checking, and then restart the printing process. It's not impossible, it's just more challenging, I would argue, than in traditional machining. So there is uh, much less reliance on in-process inspection. Then the quality checks, as you've seen, involve more destructive testing. Of course they do dimensional testing of parts when they're finished, uh, but as you saw in the video, introducing more destructive tests on printed parts. So then here is a quick side-by-side -side comparison of the quality tools that are used in traditional machining compared to additive manufacturing. And I split it out. Prior to machining, you do a fair reliance on raw material destructive testing. In process inspection is fairly common in a traditional machining process, whereas in additive manufacturing, as far as I know, is much more difficult and so we rely much less on in process inspection. Of course, on the finished part of a traditional machined piece, a uh, significant amount of dimensional and form inspection that tends to be the focus, in addition to visual inspection, looking for things like chatter or tool marks, surface finishes, uh, imperfections on the surface and so on, doing some hardness testing, and of course, some destructive testing, and the use of SPC, whereas with additive manufacturing in the finished part, yes, we're going to do the dimensional and form inspection. I would argue that so far the tolerancing of additive manufactured parts is less than the tolerancing ability of traditional machining or milling, and so I expect that most use cases require less strict dimensional and form inspection of additive manufactured parts but there'll be a much heavier reliance on visual inspection of the finished part, looking for problems with the adhesion, looking for problems with layer imperfections, uh, stringing, blobbing, there's all kinds of things to look for. Much more destructive testing and still reliance on a traditional SPC system.
So the question really becomes on traditional machining, was it machined properly? Where the ultimate question for additive manufacturing is, did it bond properly? I've picked Prusa as an example here. They are one of the largest commercial 3D printer manufacturers that I'm aware of. They have been in this business for many, many years. That's a very popular printer and their technology forms the basis of much of today's modern fusion deposition modeling printers. So this gentleman in the video, Joe, is Joe Prusa, who is the inventor of many of these technologies. Joe, this is amazing. This is your, this is your print farm right here. Yes, it is. How many machines do you have in this? So right now we have 500 printers here. 500? Yes. <gasps> That's amazing. And there's around 400 more around the office. Yes. 900 printers in total in this building just yes. printing things. Yes. So these 500 are dedicated to the parts that go in the kits and, the, and the, the fully built machines, right? Yes, yes, yes. That's how we make the parts. And it's roughly 30% of the machine, I would say. Okay. What about... Oh, okay. Yes. And the parts are printed in, is this PETG? Yes, that's okay. our own PETG, which is manufactured actually one floor below us. So when, actually, when we actually finish up the spool, we take them down and they are mounted again. <laughs> and actually our ERP system tells, uh, tells the farmers which and how many of the plates they need to start when, when the print's finished. Okay. And these printers are actually connected to our ERP system through Ethernet and they have modified uh -huh. firmware so when the plate finishes uh, it asks the operator if it was a successful print and because it knows by the name of the plate uh, how many and which parts were there it loads them into our inventories they all have i'd like to point out just a couple of things that joe prusa has mentioned here and the point that i want to make is that 3d printing is no longer in its infancy this is very well established technology now and the equipment they're using is very very reliable so here at the Prusa plant their print farm as I mentioned has 500 machines printing away unattended or virtually unattended by individual operators and they're running 24 7 to put this into perspective a mid-sized manufacturer might have four or five CNC machines or a half a dozen milling machines and and uh, or perhaps a dozen of these different machines but not measured in the hundreds so the price of the individual machines is fairly low the output rate of the machines maybe is comparable to traditional machining um, because uh, the Maybe the process is a bit slower, but you're producing multiple pieces at one time, so the batch cycle isn't so bad. And they've really come into their own. In this print farm, the printers are all connected to a local area network, all controlled by an ERP, an enter enterprise reporting system. So it's fully aware of the job scheduling, the job completion rate, um, it logs parts into finished parts inventory when they're done printing. If there needs to be upgrades, those are all done through the network. So then you come back to traditional quality tools that would be used in a production environment in terms of planning, scheduling, quality controls, quality checks and the like. And those all have translated now into this additive manufacturing. But what, what is interesting is that we also have uh, automatic hoppers here. Uh, the resin gets sucked from the drying hoppers. Okay. And uh, that is just colorless resin. Oh, this is this is how you make different colored filaments. Is, yes. is pulling the pigment from here, yes. but automatically. Yeah. Okay. And so what, what is special about this is that it's gravimetric. Usually, uh, that means that it sucks the master batch in. Right. And it weighs it precisely 
uh, down to you know one tenth of the gram oh. to make the mix perfect. So when we make the recipe, it's always the same. Oh, this way, the spool one and spool ten are the same color. Yes, got yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, and there it is, right there. There's the filament, and this is our first cooling tank. Okay, so just a quick note: we were talking about raw material and the condition of the raw material and the traceability. So. Here, Prusa is a little unique in that they make their own raw material. And if you think about it, that's quite unique for a machining industry as well. Um, it would take a very, very large company if they were doing CNC machining to also make their own steel. Uh, that would be almost unheard of. But in the printing industry, in particular plastic printing, Prusa has done this to incorporate additional quality measures on their own production. So they control the quality of the raw material as part of their printing process. Uh, what, is, uh, what is interesting here, that uh, here we are continuously checking the color. So you can verify that your automatic yes. method back there is producing the same color yes. all the time. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. And also if the master batch gets, you know, a little bit diluted or something, uh, we can check that it, it, it's exactly matching our recipe. And uh, here after that is uh, the laser. Uh, we checked the diameter from two sides at 90. And by the readings uh, from the laser, uh, you want to change the diameter. But it's not actually done uh, by speeding up or slowing down the extruder, because that has a lot of lag. So it's, it's rotating at constant speed. Right. But the pour can pull faster and it will make the filament thinner or slower and oh. it will make the filament wider. And, th and this is automatic? Yeah, all its closed loop system, basically P PID. And so Mr. Proust has just raised a, an interesting point. In the production of the filament, the diameter is one of the critical to quality characteristics. Any user of a 3D printer knows you want to have very consistent, very reliable diameter of the filament. So they are constantly monitoring the diameter as it comes through the process and adjusting the essentially the pull rate of the material coming through the process so they can either increase or decrease the pull or the tension on the strand as it comes through thereby controlling the diameter throughout the process on a continuous basis. So in terms of traditional quality tools, you might recognize that as being EPC, Engineering Process Control. Contrast this with SPC, Statistical Process Control. The basic difference is in a traditional SPC system or Statistical Process Control, uh, the quality team or the machine operator will take samples plot them on some sort of a graph that may be done electronically and see that the process is drifting, identify when it's out of control, then make some adjustments to the machine or to the process to bring it back into control. Engineering process control is, as described by Joanne, this system where the process output is constantly being measured and constantly being adjusted. So in theory, the process is always in control. It's forced to be in control moment by moment by moment, making micro adjustments to the process to make sure that the diameter, in this case, always stays within a narrow tolerance band. So if the data from this line were plotted in a simple tool like Minitab, for example, and you looked for special causes, in theory, you would see none. Uh, you can, be behind you, on the, on the wall, you can see the dashboard. Oh, right there. Yeah. In this room, there are two lines, and you can see uh, two dashboards. You can see which recipe we are doing, and you can see the diameter in both axes, and the average diameter uh, from both of the axes. Okay, and, and, and there's, a, there's a tolerance per axis, right? Yeah, there's a tolerance uh, for the diameter and also a tolerance for the color. Okay. And if, uh, if any, any of that uh, goes out of spec, uh, actually you will 
you will not be able to put uh, uh, put the QR code on the spool, so it never comes out. Is that something? Yeah. So I'll chime in here. The 3D printing technology, like any new manufacturing technology, technology is under continuous process improvement. And here I've illustrated a simple example. One of the traditional problems with 3D printing is with very long print times, something in the order of three, four, six, eight, twelve hours to print a small part. This you can't just sit there and watch it for ten hours. The printer at some point is going to be left alone. And it's very difficult to know whether you're going to run out of filament on the reel or not during the printing. And simple things like this, additional quality checks in this case a built-in sensor that detects whether there is a presence of filament or not. So this becomes a new critical to quality characteristics of the printing process and so new quality checks. This is a simple example but I think that you'll find this in any review of a new technology, any element of the Industry 4.0 technologies that we're looking at where uh, in the end, you'll find a blend of traditional quality tools being used, plus new quality inspections, perhaps new tools, but at least new sensors or new devices or new ways of detecting CTQ or quality characteristics of your process.